We're going to call this meeting to order. This is the March 21st meeting of the Sayuslaw Valley Fire and Rescue Board of Directors. Uh, please let's, uh, stand for a pledge of allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Mary, please call roll. Director Carnahan? Here. Director Woodbury? Here. Director Green? Here. Director Phillips? Here. Director Nixon? Here. Great, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Before we get on with the agenda, due to the request of a couple of presenters, we're going to change the agenda around a little bit. And so uh, after we review the minutes, we're going to move into presentations uh, on Florence Urban Renewal Agency and from Chris Marr, Auditor. So we'll get to that in just in a second. Uh, so we have the meeting minutes from the February 21st meeting. As the board reviewed them, is there any questions or comments? Entertain a motion for approval. Oh, entertain a motion. Do we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion and second. All in favor to approve, please say aye. 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 Great. Just abstain. Abstain from director. What do you think here? Uh, all right. So if we can, again, move this around, uh, welcome back. John is going to provide an update for us on Florence Urban Renewal. Okay, well, I'll be real brief this evening. This evening. We're kind of in between uh, projects right now, and as you guys probably know, Revision Florence, which is the, the uh, redo of 126 from Quince to the intersection and then from the intersection to the bridge. It's fairly extensive. It's, it's about a $7 million project, and it's going to require a uh, very what we're doing, we're working in conjunction with ODOT because they're going to start resurfacing 101 over that same area. And we were able to piggyback with them and get some um, design and financial assistance on that. And what it will involve is uh, changing the angles on some of the intersections so they're not so acute, undergrounding all the utilities, all new street lighting, streetscaping, some artwork, just really put lipstick on it. If you guys, any of you uh, have noticed in Sisters or McMinnville, you know, as those are fairly significant uh, changes. We're kind of in that same ballpark. And we got, uh, got quite a bit of funding from uh, the county through the room tax uh, situation that we pay into. We got a million, <coughs> million two from them, which is good. But anyway, uh, I'll have more to talk about uh, in the future. The timeline right now is the, the final uh, draft will be approved and go out to bid on April 10th. The contract will be let on, I believe, June 5th. Construction will begin the first week in August. And the plan is to do the whole west side first because they want to get it finished before roadie days next spring since that's the roadie parade goes down the west side. So they're going to do the west side first, and then the east side, and then it'll be finished in uh, mid-2020. So well, well on the road, and everything looks real good. Do you have any questions at this point in time? Hopefully next, by next time, we'll have all the ODOT approvals on all the plans. We'll integrate their, their designs with ours, and we can have a PowerPoint where we can put it up on the screen. Kind of show, but I think it'll look pretty good. Is there anything available at this point, like online or someplace in terms of? Yeah, if you go to the website, but the problem is on, on the uh, it's, it's the detail doesn't show really that well on the drawing. You can't see the detail and, and get a feel for it. But it is on there if you want to take a look at it. They have they have a good website. John, have they decided on uh, the structure for the gateways? Not totally. Uh, there's been a lot of input, and now they're working with the uh, vendors, basically, to get get that kind of finalized. And uh, well, we should have that in a month or so. These lanes, are they going to be full width, or are you going to cut down on the lanes? Uh, uh, they aren't going to be any narrower. Okay. Uh, and I think they're going to, I think they're still going to have two pedestrian mediums, kind of the ones that are there now. but. 
they're going to try to minimize those to a certain extent. But they are one of the good things they're doing is they're rounding a lot of the corners on these oblique streets or whatever. So larger, we can route more efficiently route commercial trucks and such around a little more easily. Well, I know in, in Walport, the narrow they when they did the parking, those mm -hmm. narrow those lanes got really narrow. And if I'm stretched out, it's the lanes are I'm taking up the whole lane. Last time I heard they weren't. Okay. But the, one of the things they're doing are they're they're changing the configuration on the sidewalks and things and they they have all the easements and everything pretty well finished now, so I think they're on the road to recovery. But they should have uh, more next month on it when they go out to bid some of that. So, and then bring some full size drawings back for everybody to look at. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Any yeah. other questions? Is there anybody do, in terms of representing the fire department and how that construction is going to affect anything? Is everything pretty much going to stay the same for us? Oh, yeah, I don't think it'll affect you guys at all. Okay. I mean, the lighters are, and none of that's going to. No, we're not coming up, they're not coming up this far with the lighting. Do you have, do you have anything? I, yeah, I can, can speak to that. So, when there are construction plans and the planning process, our fire prevention person is involved and uh, attends meetings. I don't know if they're weekly, but on a, on a regular basis to discuss those projects to make sure that our operational needs are accounted for. I'm just thinking about when they, if, if and when they close certain things down because they're working on this, or is that hydrant going to be out of commission? So, you know, I'm just assuming we have to, like you said, someone's working with them so that we're a little bit left. A lot of the construction, as I understand it, will be done at night. Oh. And, you know, having lived through the bridge for the last two years, it should be just okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in general, we do get foreclosures um, just, you know, for other projects, we get regular notifications and what we do is uh, we'll communicate that to the duty chief and, and the captains as appropriate. I think ODOT's pretty sensitive about shutting their highway down. <laughs> Talk about shutting down 101, they get kind of glassy. I don't want that for Okay, any other questions? Anything else? Great. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for serving on this board for the benefit of our community as well. Uh, oh, so Urban Urban Urban. Urban. thank you for letting me in early. Yeah. <laughs> All yes. right. Uh, well, we've got Chris Marr from Chris Marr and Associates who has conducted the annual audit uh, for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2017. And Chris, you're on. Let's go ahead and present that. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, work with your organization and also the flexibility of allowing me to uh, kind of jump up on the agenda. Um, so uh, in front of you is a, uh, both the financial statements and our auditor's report, uh, and also there is a inserted there, there should be a uh, set of letters that are uh, separate from the actual audit report. Um, those are required communications that we have to uh, convey to you as a board. They're not part of the actual audit report itself, but they are additional required communications as uh, promulgated by the uh, professional standards for CPAs. So I'm going to take just a few minutes to talk about the, the actual audit report, the financial statements. Uh, this report is kind of broken up into about three or four categories. Obviously, in the front section is our auditor's report, uh, along with a little brief uh, editorial management discussion analysis that kind of gives some very high summarized information about the organization and some comparative information year over year. Um, and then we have the actual basic financial statements. Those encompass everything from uh, government-wide financial statements. So when we talk government-wide, that is a um, full accrual uh, presentation of accounting. So that would include all assets of the district, all liabilities of the district, um, which is different than perhaps the way you budget uh, for. So your buildings, um, those are included in the government-wide financial statements. When we're looking at just more of your fund-based financial statements, those don't include your buildings. It pretty much just includes your cash accounts, your property taxes, and then the bills that you have on it. That's essentially uh, what you basically operate under on a budget year cycle. So 
that's really kind of the difference between those two. Um, again, that is under uh, general tip of accounting principles a number of years ago. Um, the Government Accounting Standards Board um, thought it was more important for governments to present um, information, financial information about their uh, particular organization that uh, would have a complete picture of where the organization is at uh, in terms of what assets does it have, what liabilities does it owe, uh, including pension liabilities and long-term bond indebtedness, etc. So that's really kind of the difference between perhaps what you would see in your uh, fund-based financial statements, which are also in there as well. So that's kind of the basic financial statements, and then following that are the notes to the financial statements. The notes incorporate many things about the organization in terms of describing policies and procedures, as well as details about some of the particular items in the financial statements themselves. Um, and then the last piece uh, of that is some detailed budgetary schedules. So these are things that probably kind of line up more with your budget, so you can kind of see uh, where you are as an organization, budget versus actual, in terms of did you have any uh, areas or variances where you might have spent more than uh, you had budgeted. Um, you didn't have anything like that, so just to reassure you all, so you were uh, in compliance with your budget. Uh, and then the, the final section of, of the report is actually an additional report um, to uh, discuss and report on your compliance with Oregon Revised Statutes. So as a municipality, you have certain things that you are uh, obligated uh, to comply with. That's everything from uh, how you budget, how you invest your uh, particular uh, resources in terms of cash and, and investments, um, your process for uh, making major procurements uh, of equipment or particular facilities, um, so those are all things that we are required to report uh, to you as well as the state and to, to identify any non-compliance issues. Um, in summary, our auditor's report, um, we're providing you with an unqualified opinion. Sometimes people refer to it as a clean opinion uh, on your financial statements. They are fairly stated in conformity with general accepted accounting principles. Uh, in all material respects. So we measure materiality, that's a somewhat of a statistical uh, number that we calculate. Uh, we calculate it not just on your government-wide financial statements, but also in those underlying fund financial statements as well. Um, and that tends to be a smaller number. Um, are there adjustments that we make or propose to management? There are, and we'll talk about those in the letters in just a moment. And then the, the second piece that I kind of wanted to touch on is in terms of a report to the state on your compliance with ORSs. Um, you were in compliance with all areas that we reviewed. Uh, and so in, in, a, in a nutshell, it's a thumbs up in terms of uh, your work, the district uh, being in compliance with, with both ORSs and your financial statements being fairly stated. And I would say with a few challenges last year, congratulations to staff for that opinion, so thank you. Yeah. Any questions on the financial statements themselves? If you do have any, feel free to contact me directly or you can convey them through um, with uh, Chief Jim. Uh, but yeah, we're more than happy to, to respond to any questions or concerns that you have. So flipping over to the letters, um, there's five six pages to this thing. Um, I'm going to try to touch on just a few of the, the more the critical items in these. Um, the first one, uh, beginning on page one, um, we, we require to kind of communicate to you the process of the audit, as well as some of the qualitative aspects of uh, your organization in terms of what policies do you have, have you adopted any new policies, in terms of financial reporting. Um, you don't have anything like that. We're also required to um, identify in the financial statements, are there any significant estimates uh, in your financial statements that might be more sensitive? And you don't have a lot of estimates, but as accountants, yeah, we like to be precise, but not everything is precise in financial reporting. There are estimates involved. Um, 
The two that are that are most significant is the uh, for depreciation purposes when you guys acquire a, a apparatus or a building, we depreciate that cost over time for presenting the government wide financial statements. There's an estimate on how long that these buildings, the apparatus, are going to last. It's an estimate. They may last longer, they may have last less, but nevertheless, it's an estimate. So uh, that's one item. The other item that is um, a lot more difficult is the liability for estimating uh, the PERS pension liability. Um, so um, in the financial statements, and you don't need to flip there, I'm just going to uh, make mention to it. Um, the liability as measured actuarially uh, by the PERS actuaries uh, for the Sayusville Valley Fire District is 1,318,917. So 1.3 million, rounded off. Um, there's a lot of estimates involved in measuring that liability. How long are people going to live after retirement? When are they going to retire? How much are we going to earn on investments? Um, and for example, in the notes, it talks about one of those particular assumptions in the PERS measurement is the discount rate for which they determine the PERS assets versus the liabilities. So the assumption is a 7.5% discount rate. That's a pretty uh, aggressive assumption. That's the one that the state has agreed to use. If the rate varied 1%, um, when, let's say from 7.5% to let's say 6.5%, your liability would go from 1.3 million to 2.1 million. Mm -hmm. Just a 1% difference there. Uh, and so, again, there's estimates involved in these numbers. Uh, you know, that pension liability calculation, um, it's a little bit crazy. There's about 10 pages of notes talking about the PERS uh, system and the PERS liability. Um, you know, in summary, what I can say about it is, you know, should you pay attention to it? Yes. Um, is it going to change completely everything you do as an organization? Probably not. Um, and the reason I say you should pay attention to it is understanding that that liability has grown from year to year, and it will vary from year to year as well, depending on how the performance of, of the actual investments do in the plan, as well as the actual experience. Um, so what the part you should pay attention to is that that liability continues to grow. Understand that your PERS rates are going to continue to grow as well, which means your cost on an annual basis is going to, to be increasing, and you would want to factor that into your budget uh, in the future. Long term, long term. Year over year, maybe not so much, but long term, you should be thinking about that. So enough said about PERS and that estimate. Um, and then uh, flipping over to uh, page two. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've provided you with an unqualified opinion on the financial statements that they're fairly stated. Now, when we come out and do an audit, uh, for many of our organizations, they don't necessarily have the accounting personnel that can put everything in order for us so that it can be compliance with general accepted accounting principles. Uh, most of our uh, municipalities that we work with um, don't have CPAs on staff and have complete knowledge of things. So there are generally going to be some adjustments that we make. Uh, as Ron mentioned, last year was a little bit of a bumpy year. Uh, there were some adjustments that we made. Uh, we were able to get the documentation, just so you know, to make those adjustments. Um, it's just a lack of knowledge, I guess is a good way to put it. A lot of those things didn't happen, and so we had to propose those adjustments. Um, we've provided a copy of those journal entries to Dina. She's got them if you really want to look at the details. Uh, she will be making those adjustments to your records uh, so that they are trued up, if you will, with the uh, June financial statements. So I uh, do, do want to just share that with you. And just a question on that. So yes. Sir. Uh, maybe, and maybe for staff or for Dina. So that could be part of maybe next month's report as to the detail to those transactions. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, some other things that we, we do to kind of have to just let you know, um, you know, do we have any issues in terms of getting information from, from uh, staff? Do we have any disagreements with management on some of the positions that we were taking in terms of proposing adjustments or some of the things we observed? 
Uh, none of that came up. Uh, so, you know, staff was very cooperative in providing us information uh, so that we could do our job and actually audit your records. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm going to skip over to page um, four. So this is a, another uh, communication that you may or may not see for an organization. Uh, for most of our uh, smaller municipalities that we audit, um, we usually have this communication as well. Um, what this basically discusses is some of the items we observed in your controls and processes of your organization. Um, so it goes beyond kind of, you know, can we tie out numbers or not to supporting documentation. It's really, hey, here are some things that we observe uh, with your organization and perhaps some ways to maybe improve them. So one of them is, as I mentioned, you don't have a CPA on staff to do all the stuff that goes into presenting and compiling this information in a financial statement. Um, because of that condition, that's considered a control deficiency as we interpret it. Uh, is it a black mark against your organization? No. Will it affect your funding in the future with respect to grants uh, or bond issues? No. Um, like I said, many of our small municipalities have this particular condition. Really, the only way to fix it is to hire a CPA, and I'm not suggesting that you do that. Um, the other issue is, because you're a small organization, there are certain things that you cannot completely segregate duties. So really for us to have good controls in place, we want somebody to be control or have custody of the assets themselves and somebody else that's more in control of, if you will, the reporting or documentation of those assets. And the same thing would be on the liability side as well. Um, you don't have that kind of staff in place. We're not suggesting you hire two or three people just so you can have complete segregation of duties in those areas. Nevertheless, it is a condition that you have in your organization. And again, many organizations that we audit have the same dilemma. Um, so we're not suggesting you hire somebody to, to be a CPA. You're not suggesting you hire more staff to kind of segregate these duties. What we are suggesting is that you, A, acknowledge that this is a condition and that uh, you as board members will have involvement, if, and you already do have involvement, as you know, with some of those particular processes. Um, so you, I believe, get uh, financial statements on a monthly basis. You do uh, review um, the voucher listing. I believe you're getting a, a listing of, of bills that are paid on a monthly basis. Uh, you would, you should, and continue to look at those. And if there's a question mark, scrutinize it. Uh, ask management. Um, that's really kind of your job. Ultimately, you as a board have responsibility for those things. So uh, beyond that, we're not suggesting you do anything else with regards to addressing those issues. Now, there's some other items that came up that don't rise to the level of being control deficiencies. There are things we observed. Uh, with regards to the organization and some of the processes uh, during our, our audit that we've identified as areas where you can make some improvements to your uh, processes um, to not only reduce the risk of, of an error occurring, um, whether it be to, to fraud or to error, but also um, a way to kind of, you know, provide a little bit higher level of, of assurance to you as a board. Uh, that things are uh, being handled uh, properly. So with that, uh, I'm, again, there's, there's quite a few items here. I'm going to try to be somewhat brief for you guys here on these things, but um, some entity level, level controls, policies, and pre procedures. So uh, to strengthen your controls over cash and records, you know, one thing we'd really like to see is bank reconciliations are being done, but we'd really like to see somebody other than staff uh, certainly staff that are preparing those bank reconciliations, at least looking at those bank reconciliations. Um, do you have to have really a lot of knowledge about a bank reconciliation itself? Well, it helps, but you know, there's just a few items that you can look at on that bank rec to see if it makes sense. For example, uh, 
the bank reconciliation should indicate what the bank's balance is at that particular time uh, that the reconciliation is being performed. It should also list any items that are not on the bank statement because they haven't cleared yet, those outstanding items, if you will. So one of the things we would suggest is, does that make sense, first of all? The other thing is, look at that list of outstanding items. Is there something that's more than three months old? If there is, then I would ask why. Somebody lost the check? Has it been not negotiated? Um, we did, you know, during our testing, we noted that there were quite a few, management had already dealt with it, but there were quite a few old outstanding checks that had never cleared the bank. And, you know, why is always the question. So um, that's a really great way to do it. The fire chief, certainly chief can look at that, but, you know, better yet would be when you use a board member volunteer for that. And, I, you know, again, it's not a, a really detailed process. It might take you five minutes to look at it. Uh, might take longer if there's some issues, but um, the idea is to detect those things in a timely manner, not wait for the auditors to come out front. Um, next item, I think you're already doing it. You've got a uh, transaction list. Um, but right now, the administrator has been providing that list. Um, we have seen instances where the uh, that list goes to the board, comes back to the person in control of the, cut, the, the records, and they can manipulate that listing afterwards. So uh, the idea is, you know, somebody other than uh, the finance person should do that. Um, the other item, uh, you know, a way that fraud can be per perpetrated is through the creation of uh, phony vendors. Um, and so a real easy thing to do is on a maybe quarterly basis, one of you board members takes a look at the vendor list to see if there's anybody on there that looks a little bit awkward. Acme company or something like that. Uh, fraud is perpetrated many times this way. People will go to the extent of actually setting up a DBA state, uh, setting up a bank account, creating an invoice, it looks legitimate in your eyes as a board. Oh, Acme Cook, sign off the check, it gets paid. Uh, and at the end of the day, the only way that gets found out is if somebody else is looking at that vendor list. Now, we also do some testing at the end of the, when we're out for the audit, looking at vendors. Um, and, but we're not in control. You don't want to wait till we're out here doing that to find out that somebody's been paying some phony vendor. So. Again, we don't suspect fraud is occurring. This is just a good thing to have in place to prevent fraud from occurring. And Chris, this is being mentioned because there's not any evidence of vendor review in place. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, next item, uh, I've talked to a staff about this a little bit in terms of a solution. So we have this IGA arrangement. And there's some bills that often impact both agencies. And the question is, how do we document what portion belongs to Western Lane versus Sayusla Valley Fire? Uh, and it can get a little bit money sometimes. The, the clean, easy way to do it would be to have your vendors send a bill to Western Lane and a bill to uh, Sayusla Valley Fire. But sometimes that's not even very reasonable solution because do you want, for example, your attorney to be spending, you know, extra time to you to separate those bills? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so ideally, yeah, we'd like to see separate bills if they truly are separate and distinct for each agency. If it's one of those particular items where it's really kind of hard to say, hey, it could be both. Uh, a solution might be that both agencies agree that this kind of comes under the, the piece of the IGA and both agencies contribute equally and just agree to share those costs. So uh, that's something that I kind of Jim and I have talked about here briefly before the meeting. Um, we will be working kind of with management on some action items for these things and, and kind of helping out with some action items on that. So, um, last item. Uh, again, this is more of a management issue, but we do want to make you aware of it. You know, QuickBooks, it's a great little system, but it's sometimes it's not very intuitive. And so a lot of times in the memo line, if you don't actually physically go in and change the memo line 
for an invoice from the same vendor, for an example, it'll need that same memo in there. And it really kind of makes it confusing to look at the records to try to identify, well, this looks like this is a bill being paid twice. No, it's not. We just didn't update the memo. So again, that's really kind of more of a, a training issue within uh, for staff. Uh, so that you know, putting an invoice number in would help. That's also a good control because we all want to make sure that invoices are being paid twice. So, um, balance sheet review. I'll be real brief on this. So, you know, in addition to like items on the P and L, income and expense, looking at budget for versus actual, it would be nice to see somebody look at, if you will, a balance sheet. So, look at the the, the cash accounts, but also look at liability accounts. Are liability accounts appearing reasonable? Are there debit balances and liabilities? There shouldn't be debit balances and liabilities. Um, are there liabilities that seem to be growing, 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 and never going down? That's usually an indication that maybe a bill's not getting paid, or the bill's getting paid, it's just not properly getting relieving that liability. So that's just another thing. Again, uh, a review, it's a small little process. It's not a big thing. Um, uh, then the next item, credit card charges and payments. So um, <coughs> we noted that there were oftentimes the credit cards were getting paid. Uh, a lot of times the charges on those credit cards or debit cards were not getting properly uh, distributed to uh, proper accounts. So uh, that was probably one of our journal entries was trying to move those things out of uh, one account and into another. Again, the charges were proper, I want to reassure you of that. They just weren't properly categorized. Um, so, and then uh, the final piece uh, is on some of your payroll processing. Um, so, when there are changes in payroll, and that can happen maybe once a year, maybe multiple times a year, but when there are changes in payroll, um, we believe that payroll rates were properly reflected in the processing of employees' payroll, but the documentation for it was not really clear. And so we really like to see a little bit better documentation in the, in the personnel file, uh, as well as the payroll files, that um, payroll rates have been properly approved by uh, supervisor management, etc. cetera. So, um, next item. So there were a few months, March and April, where some of the employees deferred compensation didn't get paid as quickly as we would expect it to. Usually that should get paid within 15 days of the following month of, of the payroll. Um, didn't get paid until July. I think that would have got caught if somebody was looking at the balance sheet, looking at those liabilities and say, how did this deferred comp liability so high? Should have got paid, didn't get paid. So, um, and then, um, Another little observation, this kind of goes to the payroll changes, some documentation for your payroll records. So we had some uh, accrued compensation uh, that was being calculated. Somebody had gone over the max and nobody was really tracking that. So honestly, those should be probably kept, kept up to date on a, on a pretty regular basis, monthly quarterly. I think QuickBooks, <coughs> I believe you guys went away from using payroll through QuickBooks a while back, QuickBooks does have that function. Uh, I know you outsourced the payroll for a while to was it Portland Payroll. Um, and so part of the issue is if you have a payroll company doing it, they may or may not be up, up to date on knowing what's happening with accrued leave. And so it becomes this other manual process that's not necessarily integrated with your payroll process. So um, point is, you know, somebody should be looking at it on a regular basis. Uh, and then the final piece, um, so as part of the whole PERS uh, calculation, we do some testing. Uh, we test the census records to make sure everybody that's in the PERS system is supposed to be in the system and that there's nobody missing. Um, some of the data uh, in the PERS record wasn't necessarily lining up exactly with payroll data. Um, if we had a process in place where somebody was reviewing that and reconciling it on a more regular basis, um, that probably would, the, the likelihood of those errors occurring would be less. 
They weren't material, uh, just to reassure you that they were pretty insignificant, but ideally those numbers should kind of line up. Um, so. uh, lastly, like I said, I'm going to be following up with Jim and with Dina on some of the action items on this. They may discuss it uh, with you as well, uh, but yeah, the idea is to hopefully you know, help with that uh, action item agenda. Um, to kind of strengthen your processes and controls. Questions? Well, I was just going to comment, so I think you answered that. Uh, it would be prudent to have a resp response back to the board as well as to what management's doing on these process controls. Uh, I know we've talked about a lot of this already over the course of the last nine months, but I think a written response to the board would be appropriate. Yeah, and it will be. Uh, it's required, actually, the Division of Auditors now requires that we uh, submit to them an action uh, item to that. So uh, I've got a template as far as how to, to put that together, so I'll share that with, with Jim and Dina. Great. They can work on it, get your guys' kind of thumbs up, A-OK -okay on it, and then we'll submit that. Okay. We're actually just discussing that before we came up. Good. Anything on the board? Questions or comments? I'm sure you've read this cover to cover. Uh, not it's really good bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Especially if you focus on that first note. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Just a quick question. John, yes, please. Um, on our financial statements, we get a uh, credit card. Yes. Does it break it down any further than that? Is that normal? Let's run that by me again. Uh, on our financial statement here, yes. the credit card bill is there. Yes. It doesn't say what that credit card charges were. Oh, yeah, I think is a copy that, of the credit card that, statement would be good to get with your packet that would identify what items are, what those items are. And that may be quite a list. I mean, I'm not saying that, that it's not, but that's sometimes a fairly significant amount of money. It is, yeah. And, you know, I would say at, at the minimum, it'd be nice for you to just, as a board, ask for it from time to time. You know, if you want to do it monthly, that's great, but I'd say ask for it from time to time because, you know, at least there's an unpredictability piece of that thing that, you know, you can kind of hold management uh, accountable to, to get that stuff done. So. Well, I think overall the board understands kind of its role as a, in a governing perspective, but the, out, the issues you outline with respect to controls that because of the size of the organization, we really can't do that internally. So perhaps we can talk more about what reporting might be necessary to help us understand. Mm -hmm. so. uh, and I know we're migrating eventually to new financial accounting software. Um, I hope at some point that we can have a balance sheet that corresponds with the period ending income statement presented to the board regularly as well. It's a little bit difficult to get the complete balance sheet with our current system. Yeah. But yeah uh, I, Talk to Jim a little bit about the systems that you're looking at. I think Cassell is maybe one. Um, it does a pretty good job. Uh, it's fairly robust. Uh, I know a lot of cities that did use it. Uh, that you'll will be able to get a balance sheet. QuickBooks, you know, it's it's nice little software, but it does have limitations, especially in the governmental realm. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else, for Chris? Not, thank you very much. Thank you, really appreciate it. You know, I, I want to apologize. Before we got into anything, the first thing I should have done was welcome Dean McClure to Cyrus Love Valley Fire. So I'm glad much. you're here. So, okay, we'll get back to our regular program uh, schedule here. All right, well, here is an opportunity uh, for public comment. Certainly, this is an opportunity to address the Board of Directors on any item that is not on the agenda. Uh, as we've stated before, the maximum time for public comment is 30 minutes, with three minutes uh, allotted to each speaker. Is there any public comment this evening? With that, we'll move on uh, into our financial review. Well, today was my third day of employment here, <laughs> so I've had good lots luck. of time That's to review luck. the financials, but um, I did get the opportunity to work with Ross Schultz the last two days, 
Uh, he wasn't here today, but um, so he has prepared these financials for you. Um, we have looked over them. He didn't have anything real significant to share other than um, asking me to, to work with um, Jim here to work on the reimbursements for the grants and I guess the Conflag uh, reimbursements are still out there and coming. And, um, but other than that, um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to get back to you on the answers. If there's anything that stands out that you want me to address. Any significant uh, budget variance items to bring the board's attention to at all or I haven't seen any material? There are some, there are some in there for like some, um, oh, where was it? Basically, you know, when you, when you take into consideration all of the personnel services and all the materials and services, personnel services are, is a little over at 104.5%. And um, materials and services. Let me find that. some items that like if we're, we're paying uh, for a service up front for the year you know you paid at the beginning of the year where it's going to show it really high um, there was there is one in here um, I think that was a mistake and we talked about it and it, it's the uh, dispatching services like showed like 500 percent or something mm -hmm. like that and yeah I'm pretty sure that that was the wrong coding because it is, it is what it is. And I don't know if that answers your question, but that's part of the, the reason why you'll see that. And as we get further into the year, you, you see that drop, and you've probably seen some drops in those percentages every month. I would hope uh, as we move towards additional or new software, that would be something we can reconcile. Because that's always the question coming in is, well, through six months of the fiscal year, we budgeted X and we spent Y, how do we really know if we're on target or not? It always seems to catch up as we finish the fiscal year. Exactly, and I think it also offers us the opportunity to maybe budget with a little more detail, you know, so when you have unexpected items like the conflagrations and the expenses that are associated with that, um, what you're spending, regardless of what may be coming back in as a reimbursement, is measured against what you budgeted. And so the, the expense of this unexpected item, even though money will come back in, is going to show it really high. Yeah. Well, I'm looking right here. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Because a lot of times you have seasonal issues. You have um, things going on that you, you will be a little bit more over budget in certain categories. But then if you look at a lot of the other line items, you're way under budget in, in other um, areas. So you know, as you look at the um, personnel services, at, 104.5 and also down and I found it finally down at the bottom of page five is the total materials and services you're looking at 90.5 percent of budget so you do have some line items that are higher some line items that are lower but I mean you know the bottom line is you want to finish the fiscal year with 
um, under 100% in each appropriation category. So um, right now there's um, there are some things that we are watching, and as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, we watch them even closer. Well, yeah, I'm looking at uh, station maintenance right now, and it's at 244 percent. But you look up here, and 960 percent was station seven, and 582 percent was station five. What page are you on? So, okay. and if you read in the yeah. audit, they Those talked about um, what had, had happened there was we were under the impression what we were doing with the, the past auditor is, is that we would close out a budget year mm -hmm. with budget expenses. So, to speak specifically to Station 7, we had budgeted in the prior fiscal year to right. recite and paint that. Right. Well, as it and, and I can't remember the exact reason, but it ended up, either it was weather or whatever it was, it ended up Here carrying over into this fiscal year. So as a result of that, the expenditure associated with that, even though the money was still there, then became part of this fiscal year's budget, which was not um, budgeted for. So, and I can't remember how much it was, we'll just pick a number, we'll say that we budgeted $10,000 for that in the previous fiscal year, but now it's coming forward into this fiscal year, and that was actually mentioned in our audit that you can't do that. Right. So, and that is an excellent, yeah. excellent example of what, what he's talking, of what well, that was. I was just looking at, going through this, looking at percentages. The money is not drastic. We're not, I mean, it, it really isn't high numbers. It's really high percentage. It, it can be. You're right. If you get a budget of three thousand dollars and then you get a fifteen hundred dollar bill for something, that's tremendous. Where if you have a budget item that's a hundred thousand and you get one for three thousand, it's not going to impact it as much. Right. I was just looking at all the numbers going through here, and they were pretty substantial, percentage wise. Uh, the actual cash was not all that. I think that's important to remind ourselves of too. The cash expenditure because. Uh, the percentages alone, uh, certainly mind to look at that, but for a couple hundred bucks off here and there, we, I'm sure that can be made up somewhere, but uh, for a couple thousand dollars off. Yeah, administrative training. Uh, I'm looking at those because they're 705%, 1,421%. So I said just because of additional training expenses that, had, that we weren't prepared for or where you yeah. anticipating? I'm sorry, page two. Under administrative admin materials, um, and I'm just looking at administrative training, 75%. Administrative assistant, 755%. And the total is 1,421.5% for the total administrative expenses. Again, the, the numbers aren't huge, but I mean, they're, yeah. Well, how about we get back to you on that where we can... Would you like Mary to answer that? I'm sorry? I can answer oh, yeah, that yeah. for you. Okay, so when we had the SPAO conference, right. I like, paid the, for the conference and for the rooms, and um, it was coded to administrative training. Uh, I've since gone in and changed that to board Expenses and training, board of directors, admin expenses. I think I went down to that. Okay. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> well, that, that makes sense. That's it's just reclassified with yeah, different accounts. Yes. That makes sense. Great. And I think just to make a really quick comment, I think um, as we move forward with Dina, um, the impact of, of good leadership and management, I think, can address a number of these things. Mm -hmm. So we gone pretty close to six months yeah. with um, uh, pretty much a two day a week person and we've been extremely lucky to have that and have the skill set but it's not the same as five days a week so yeah I think you'll see a lot of those areas tightened up yeah great anything else you want to cover John yeah just under 
the deposits where when Western Lane pays into our account, where does it show up? That also was handwritten here by Ross that there was eighteen thousand dollars that uh, should have been on this February profit and loss uh, that came in after the end of February. Okay, so. and where is it deposited? What account is it? Is it punted? Is it into our checking account or into the money market? Probably into the money market. In the money market. Yeah. And then we okay. move from the money market to. Okay. Can we? Can you show that somewhere in here? That amount moving into that that account. Is that uh, possible? Because that's a deposit. Uh, it's kind of hard to track. Let me look into that for you okay. to see if Thank you. how we can present that to you. Okay. Thank yeah, you. we have. We've talked about some um, items that we can email you uh, in advance that have more detail, like the bank. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> All right. So, in reviewing the financials, the uh, bills for the month ended up at two hundred twenty thousand six twenty-nine and twenty-three cents. We need to ratify those expenditures and transfer them to the money market. Is there a motion to ratify the? Bills so moved. Declare conflict. Okay. Conflict. Oh, second. Conflict noted. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. And conflict noted. Thank you. All right. Uh, old business uh, policy committee update, and we've proposed policy review. And Jim, you want to introduce yeah, that, so please? Real quick, um, in the past we've talked about the creation of a policy committee to review, update, and um, ultimately come up with a very similar set of policies for both district. Uh, for, from a staff perspective, it can be challenging having separate policies and trying to operate underneath those. So um, we did that. We took two members, uh, two board members from each district. And we met um, earlier in this month, I forget the actual date. Um, and what we did was we reviewed a set of board um, responsibility policies. Figured that would be a good place to start. Um, we pilfered a good portion of those from another fire district that is very reputable. And um, basically, if you look at it, I think it answers if you go through those policies, it has some pretty detailed information in terms of what's expected of board members, um, how our agendas, and in fact, you'll see that our agenda format is slightly different um, than it has been in the past, and I modeled it off of what was in that policy. Um, I believe there were, I think there were about 17 policies in general. Um, what we did is we discussed them in the meeting. There were some recommendations that were made. We sent them out. For review again so the set that is being presented to you and will also is also being presented to the ambulance district is for your review and ultimately get the approval and then we can adopt those policies and begin utilizing that and i know that uh, director green and director hickson are the representatives from the fire district i don't know if you have any additional comments to that well, I will disclose that I wasn't able to make the meeting, but I did review the policies electronically, so I'll get some comments. But any questions from the board? I just have a comment. We had a three-page, a three-page uh, description of the board uh, what was required of the board, pretty well spelled out, and this is 33 pages long. Uh, I have a little problem. There's there's so much duplication in this, I have a real problem. Okay. The other thing I have a problem with is it states that uh, the board president, and I know you're fair, but you're not, we're setting up a policy for years to come. Uh, the board president really only has two things outside of, of this room that it can do. One is be the spokesman for the board on a, you know, to the media, upon the decision that this board has made. And you can add to the agenda and you can call a special board meeting. Outside of that, you really have no special powers. 
you're just a, a board member as the rest of us. Uh, I think appointing people to committees, I think it's really important that we as a board do that, not as an individual. And in here, there's, there's numerous times that, that the board president would be appointing people to different committees. I, I have a problem with that. Okay. I think it needs to be the entire board or a consensus of the board. So that's open for discussion then. Is there any other discussion on that? I think when we left the meeting, we were still, and I could be wrong, but I, I think we still had a ways to go through that part of it. I don't think we could got. I don't remember us going all the way through all the board policies. So I don't know how much of what's in there now is what we hadn't reached yet. Um, I know we talked about those things, but I don't remember going completely through the entire set of board policies in there. Of course, I was. You know, I'm, the, I'm the only one here who was at the meeting besides Jim and, and Larry Farnsworth. Might well. So um, I think we had a pretty good handle on it, but I don't, I don't remember going through the entire list of things and saying, okay, we've, we've finished everything about board policy. Um, is that, am, am I incorrect? I well, my understanding of the meeting was that we ended with you. We talked about things that we wanted to address. Um, the, I would update them, send them out to you as we did. Right. And then move forward for adoption. Right. So, in that, my understanding is what we did. Yeah. And um, I basically received affirmative comments from all committee members that this is what we discussed in the morning. Yeah, for, for, that, for that one second. Correct. Yeah. And, and I think um, something to keep in mind is that your policies. It's an ongoing, that's why you're encouraged to review them annually and um, to update them. So to think that this is going to be, that there won't be any, any additional policies or there won't be changes in your policies as you go forward would not be correct. Um, there, as you, you know, change and grow, the, the needs of your policies change. Well, and I think part of it too is, you know, we had four people, five people going through this process, which is one of the reasons why we're bringing it to the board because all of these sets of eyes is certainly better than five sets of eyes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anything, you know, we're just bringing to you what we felt, okay, these are some things that we hammered out. What is your feedback on that? So we're welcome, you know, any suggestions that you have on that. So Director Carnahan has raised a concern about authority granted to the board president. So, um, but with that, we have this on the table. Is there any more discussion about that with respect to Director Carnahan's commentary? If not, I, mean, I, I think at this point, this has been presented to the board for approval. Uh, we need to ask for, for uh, approval. If there is uh, a motion to approve uh, these board policies as presented, <clears throat> what page was that? Well, I think it comes up in a couple of places. Yeah, and and what we could do is we could go in there and just modify that to say something along the lines of board, complete board approval or something like that, consensus. What I'd like to see is it taken back, those corrections made, and then we'll review it next month. I would agree with that. Okay, so we have a motion to correct and represent and, and basically a second. I'll second. So they have a second on that. So great. We'll, we'll approve, uh, table this, and bring back the revisions. You know, to greet the board? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right. Chief, you're up. Your report. Okay. I'm busy. <coughs> Month. OK. 
Okay. Um, one of the things that is going to be on the agenda uh, for the ambulance district and letting this board um, make you, you aware of it as well, and you saw as an attachment to the uh, chief director's report, was a, an agenda bill describing some um, storage options for ambulance district, reserve ambulances, their um, rescue, and some of their items. So just real briefly, the background on that. Uh, the ambulance district had budgeted to have an addition built onto the building under the west side of the building. Um, we budgeted $50,000, came back that it was going to be anywhere from one hundred fifty dollars to $250,000 to do this. And then when we're talking that type of money, um, it makes you reconsider. The intent of this was to find additional storage, covered storage, to protect the apparatus, which you know is expensive. Um, currently what the ambulance district is doing is they're utilizing um, two separate storage locations to store some records as well as an ambulance and then they're keeping their rescue outside and the problem with that is it's exposed to the coastal air which uh, degrades the metals on that. Um, after reviewing that uh, from a staff perspective and with the thought that this came back much higher than we thought, we looked at possible options for that. Um, our top option was to move ambulances into fire stations to open up a space inside the ambulance facility so that they could store the rescue. Um, the advantage of doing that, one, we would not have to pay for additional storage. Two, um, we could also reposition one of the ambulances south of the bridge, which is a strategic move so that in the event that we had some type of a bridge failure or something like that, we have something always south of the bridge. Currently, the ambulance district's paying, I believe, around a little over $600 a month for the two storage facilities. And as we look at the expense of this, we're looking at taxpayer money, um, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And some other options that were on the table were, be, were to um, get a prefabricated fabricated building. Um, the challenges with that is that that hospital may not like that. They do have some design standards they expect them to abide by. In addition to that, it provides limited protection in the life of that is, is really unknown. Um, next option would be to have somebody other than the contractor that bid on our seismic stuff take a look at it to see if it can be lower. Um, you know, we generously thought that we could be looking from anywhere from about, I don't know, 50,000 to 150,000. That's being pretty generous if they're coming back anywhere from 150 to 250 to build this thing out. So we're still into quite a bit of money. Um, as you know, in the strategic plan, one of the things that came up was, hey, it's time to start thinking about planning for a new station two and a new ambulance district facility. And when we're thinking about money that can be spent on that, and we're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars for a facility that we may be in only for five, six years. How do we want to spend that taxpayer money? Um, so anyways, that's going to go in front of them. I wanted to present that to this board to get your um, thoughts on it to see if you had any opposition to it or, or any considerations um, for their board as they discuss that tomorrow. Question? We have a room? Yes. Okay, second, do we have, do we have any, uh, I guess, insurance type liability on, on that apparatus? We, the that was our building, their piece of equipment? Uh, we can ask, I, I do know it's the same, wise? it's the same insurer. Um, I, I don't know if that makes a difference, but we could, we could find okay. out if there's, you know, if it's stored here, does that mean to, to the fire district? We could find out. I don't know if I store a car or if I have something there's, there's a certain amount of liability that I've got to cover. In your, in your garage? Yeah. Operationally, what does that do for them in terms of having their, you know, their vehicle over there? Well, I, it, it, south of the bridge, I mean, well, it's just more of a strategic thing that in the yeah. event we needed it, it, were, it would be there that you couldn't get an ambulance across there. Yeah. Um, Operationally, what it does is, is uh, Chief Dickerson works on the resident program. Um, I believe we've got 
One of them that is in their part-time program, the other two have just received their EMTs and are working on getting in their part-time program. So what it does is if we were to store one of those apparatus here, and they're experiencing more and more back-to-back -back calls where they're running out of staff, it strategically puts our community in a better position to be able to have a driver that's really available. I thought Rescue 8, which was old Medic 3, was fully stocked as a BLS unit. Is that correct? At Station 8? Correct. correct, as a BLS. So it, it does have a vehicle south. Uh, how many ALS people do you have south, other than yourself? Uh, technical ALS is zero. Terry Madden is south of the bridge, and he is an MTI. Yeah, IV establishment. Yeah, and AD. Or, you know, in, in thinking about what would cause the need for that, um, you know, would be some type of a bridge function. And so obviously you'd be transporting personnel across that waterway, how, how you do that, if it's by boat or whatever. I mean, the, the possibilities are infinite. It's just more a matter of, you know, how do we, what can we do to better serve our community, spend talks, pay our money more efficiently, and uh, partner with an agency that's serving our district in a very similar way that we are. The other thing, you said we have room. I sat down and tried to figure out where you're going to have it. And what apparatus are we going to have that's going to sit out? We've got four vehicles sitting outside right now in the back lot. And they're actually five, but there's four of them that sit out there all the time, other than for staff. Um, Anything that sets out here is, is horrible. I mean, obviously, we know that. But we've got to take care of our own vehicles, too. So at what station, or what apparatus would you move around and still have under cover that would open up room for this? Because you have three bays at Station 8. They're all full. You've got, I walk, when I walk down, down here, Station 1 is completely full. Station two is completely full. Uh, station four, possibly you could get rid of one of those vehicles, but you'd have to surplus it out because it's, it's full too. I guess we're talking two vehicles for the ambulance district plus the records. Uh, those are HIPAA records, by the way, and they have to be under strict security. I'm not sure that I'm, I'd be willing to take on that responsibility at this point. How can we guarantee that security? With how many volunteers do we have? I'm not sure where you put it. I think our, our apparatus needs to be taken care of. And I think our vehicles need to be housed when they're not sitting in the back parking lot. That's my opinion. What, are you talking about the utility vehicles that are sitting in the back? Uh, you've got the Crown Vic, you've got the duty vehicle, you've got the uh, uh, prevention vehicle, and yeah, the utilities out there too, but you're getting ready to have. Well, I think, you know, the, really my answer to that is, is that um, what we could do is we have our operations chief put together a plan We'll have room. What's the availability of logistics? I, I don't know what's in there. Well, there's, and that's part of the plan. One of the things that we've been working on on an operational level is cleaning that up um, and opening that space up as well. So that creates additional opportunities for us. I'd like to see that plan. I think the board, but I would like to see that plan because I, I can't figure out where you're going to put all this stuff. Could you speak to a little bit about the records that Director Carnahan is speaking about as far as control and what that is exactly? Yeah, yeah um, they, you know, they would be in a secure area much like they are now. I mean, they're locked up in a storage unit and we would have them probably at our logistics station and we could um, put them in. And the, the intent of doing that is one, they are converting a lot of those into electronic records shredding them as they go so the quantity if you will has decreased significantly so it, it is a good point we could just 
put them in a side room uh, that has a lock on it that only certain administrative personnel have. There are several cabinets in there that we can lock up as well. But another advantage to that is that where they're stored now, they're stored further away and having them closer in that station actually enables the staff to have quicker access to them. Hey, we've got time, let's scan a box of them rather than have to drive up one on one. Not that it's this huge, tremendous drive, but it, it is more convenient. One of the other things is some of those records have to be kept for 30 years, especially and if you're under 21. Correct, correct. And they, um, we, and I think you'll see as we go through our policies and procedures, our records and retention policy. And, um, my understanding is that we're following all ORSs and everything in terms of record retention. So also, you know, maybe we can tell Director Carnahan feel better about the, the vehicles that are outside. The Crown Vic is got to be ending or nearing its end of life. Uh, the prevention vehicles got to be getting close. Yeah, the, and the, you know, the prevention. I mean, we can go through them. Right. We want to do that, but I've been here four and a half years and those vehicles have been outside the entire time. Um, you know, the, the prevention vehicle is, was in the past had been a staff vehicle like that vehicle and it's, again, it's mm -hmm. uncovered. Um, you know, if there is a, a need or desire to feel that we should be covering all those vehicles up, then we can certainly look at that. But all of our major apparatus um, we've brought inside. In fact, uh, um, not a piece of apparatus, but it's a trailer that has critical equipment in it. It's our MCI trailer and to ensure that it wasn't getting humidity in it and that type of thing we would get inside. So, and I think, um, you know, we've had some very preliminary discussions, but we have a lot of, we have a lot of excess apparatus and uh, as we look at what we're doing with them, what they cost to maintain, insure, et cetera. We might be, you know, versus the number of people that we have, we may be looking at um, recommending surplusing some of those, some of the, that apparatus that we have. Well, I, I understand what Director Carney is saying. But I think if we came up with a, a plan that, hey, this is how we're going to do it, this is what we're going to liquidate or surplus over this period of time. I like the idea of having uh, one of those units here for, you know, for the, with the staff that is trained to be able to man it if we need it, rather than having to go there. Um, it gives them more training opportunity. It makes them available to improve our service to the community by having people who are qualified to be able to just leave from here. Um, but like Colonel Hans said, um, I think it would be great if we just had a plan. What, you know, what is the, what is the chronological plan of how this is going to work? What's going to go where? I just think of that traffic game where you have to move the cars around. Or you get one and, the well, and, and I mean this with all due respect. Some of these things are operational. Yeah. And, and I hope that you have the confidence in myself and in my staff that we would not just do something willy-nilly like that. Hopefully you've seen in my tenure here that that has not happened. But um, we, would, you know, we would take care of that, of course. Well, I, I agree with that statement, Jim. I, I think it would be appropriate to report to the board uh, unless there's an objection to us doing this. Um, I think we, you've kind of outlined your plan. Uh, is the board, the board as a consensus would like a written plan, uh, and we could request that. But from my perspective, as far as telling you what cars to put where, uh, I don't want to be involved in that stuff. I just want to make sure all of our vehicles are, are housed inside with the I agree with that. And, and if there is risk associated if there, if this, yeah. to the district, that we have a, some sort of uh, documented mitigation plan for that, and I think maybe the HIPAA records, this is, if you report to us what the intention is, uh, how to manage that, perhaps it was. And, and that is a point well taken. And I do have a spot in my garage. So if you OK, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I've got one. Yeah. We'll put the ladder truck there. We'll get to <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, awards banquet is going to be the 28th of April. All directors are welcome to, and encouraged to attend. We hope that you can make it seismic grant. <coughs> um, a lot of big what updates. Time the, uh, what time is the awards banquet? Uh, I think, believe it starts at 5. We, they will be 
The association will be sending invitations, correct? Yes, that is correct. The theme is Hawaiian, so wear your Hawaiian shirt or whatever. Grass yeah. skirt. I'm not going to make it, I'm sorry. Um, so a lot of activity on the, the seismic grant. One, construction has started. Uh, the majority of that activity has occurred at the Ambulance District building, and I think they've finished today. They've been at um, North Fork, Clear Lake, and will be in Sutton soon, correct? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we've I've submitted the uh, first quarterly paperwork and submitted the reimbursements, and they were fast. I believe I submitted them on Monday, and I got notification today that uh, we'll have some um, stuff in our bank within the next five days. And it, uh, between all of them, because each one of these stations is considered a separate grant makes it very labor intensive, but combined uh, about $46,000 in reimbursements. So you are going to see um, in the, the financial transactions a lot of money going out to partner construction, HGE, and then probably some of it coming in. We know that they're fast, um, we've developed a good relationship with them, so hopefully they're going to they're gonna keep it up. I was Frankly, it's the first time I've ever resubmitted for a grant and there it didn't come back. Well, you need to check this box. Um, Civil Service Commission, so we had planned uh, on the 13th of having a Civil Service Commission meeting with the intent of approving the entrance register, which is essentially the hiring or ranking list, but we, um, two of them were sick, didn't attend. Um, we have rescheduled that. I got that confirmed today, so it's scheduled for the 27th. And um, we are doing everything we need to do to make that happen. Um, Safer Grant, they've got an academy going. I think um, Chief Dickerson will talk about some of that stuff, but it's, um, he's really doing quite a bit. I mean, almost to the point where we got too many people that drill <laughs> that we're having to rethink a lot of those things. ADP, uh, we're moving forward on yeah, that. I'm sorry, before you move on, mm -hmm. can you just briefly address the board, uh, Bo is kind of, Involvement upriver, how much time is spending Mableton, Medwood, et cetera, in recruiting? Well, yes, yes. So, what we do is um, we provide them multiple services through recruitment and retention, which essentially involves um, anything from training their volunteers to helping in recruiting and, and that type of thing. So, in addition to recruitment activities, actually getting somebody in and the recruit academy, I think we're up there every two, three months. and we. Drill out on a shooter up there just the other night. Uh, we have planned drills once monthly where we send a crew up to drill with them. And where we can actually conduct the drill as a, as a retention technique. Um, I know that he's spent quite a bit of time um, in both districts, uh, Swiss Home Deadwood as well as Mapleton, you know, sending out questionnaires, creating um, materials for them for recruitment like pamphlets and those types of things. So, the, the response and um, that, that he receives from the two districts, it varies quite a bit. So I can tell you that Swiss Home Network is very responsive, and as a result, I mean, they're, they're doing very well in their stuff. So it, we are committed um, quite a bit to doing that. Actual hours, um, I can have him report on that in the future. If that's something that you would like, um, that's not an issue to do that at all. Okay. Yeah, actually, it could be great. And, and one of the things I think to keep in mind is as we do this is um, remember that a lot of these activities that are recruitment and retention related apply to all three districts simultaneously. So. Thank you. Um, let's see here. ADP, we're moving forward on that. A AFG grant, um, we're told by the vendors that the hose will be here next week. And Chief Tickerson will be working on a plan with our partner agencies to get that, um, that hose delivered. Um, we've begun negotiations with the SBFR 851. We had one meeting, and then um, this last one we had to cancel, so we'll be back on for April. Phone system is in. Um, I just got a thing today, and I cannot remember the date, but they're gonna be coming in doing the advanced training, so it's up and it's running. It's, it's, it's working just fine. Um, and I think really that's a, about it, other than what's already in there. If you have any questions for me, anything else from the board? Any 
and do you want to speak at all on the community support team or is this open for questions? Uh, or, you know, I, I can. I just don't want to drone on and yeah. bore you guys to death. So yeah, I think the reporting is going to be adequate. So. Uh, anything for JMLs before we move on? Great. Uh, Chief Dickerson, then, Ops Report. <coughs> Uh, these are the, the call information for February, so you'll notice the fire property loss is significantly lower than it will be for March due to the Labula fire. Uh, 39 calls for February. It was a relatively quiet month, but we are at 92 calls for the year. Uh, number of firefighters per incident is holding steady at nine. Uh, that number does jump up and down a little bit. We average it out. Our average response time is holding at the eight minutes, and that's throwing out the outliers. Uh, we've had some significant long distance responses that we, we factor out of that. As far as training, the Elf Academy is going on, it's going really well. There are 21 people in that academy and it's it's very busy. Uh, hey Jim, can you uh, just mention how many are from Swiss Home Devil and how many are from uh, Mapleton? There is a, yes. one from Mapleton, 11 from Swiss Home Deadwood, and wow. the remaining are us. Uh, we had we had more for it, but they ended up being able to lateral with some training from elsewhere and previous volunteers that had come back. So cut down on the numbers a little bit there. It's like five companies of eager little angry guys running around out there. Uh, Fifteen firefighters, excuse me, nine firefighters went to Winter Fire School this year, and we've had 15 going out for the dunes familiarization again just last month. So everybody's staying up and current. As we look to the future, we're really focusing on uh, Captain Larson being more of a training coordinator and utilizing some of our people that are, are getting skills and, and certified instructors to start doing a lot of the training as well. We did have a house burn that we pulled off the schedule. There was complaints from some of the neighbors on that. So we continue to seek out those opportunities that aren't a liability to the district and doesn't kind of throw us out there. On the prevention side of the house, Captain Miller uh, has hit the ground running. He did like five or six classes at the school and has been doing the second grader tours. It's always fun having those little germ factories here. Um, he's been meeting a lot with a lot of the homeowners associations and setting up uh, wildland fire prevention. Uh, we looked into the FireWise program and have been educating homeowners that live in the areas where we have the wildland interface, which is pretty much the entire community, um, how they can be more fire safe and uh, installed all 50 of our smoke alarms that we received from a grant. We're looking to extend that grant and get some more of those. On the investigation front, uh, both Cap Miller and Firefighter Pressioni uh, joined up with Southwest Fire Investigation Team. Mm -hmm. And no sooner than Cap Miller's ink got dry on his promotional letter, he had some pretty extensive experience doing an investigation. Uh, State Fire Marshal and OSP came in and helped us out with that. Uh, we're gonna have some public announcements coming out soon that you'll see that will uh, address the company level evolution, or excuse me, company inspections. Uh, BOA has taken a really hands-on approach, so the new candidates are getting some better firsthand. They have the person that contacted them, he's right in there with the uh, academy. So they're getting to see the person that brought him in. Uh, tons of documentation is included in my report, you can find that in there. Uh, the awesome success that he has also gives us some challenges. Uh, we're getting ready to buy the bunker gear again through the grant. Mm -hmm. So if we add 15 people and we buy 10 sets of gear, we're still, still working, working in there and uh, also pagers and stepping more into the, the realm of the active 911 and things, looking at great ways to summon volunteers and working with dispatch. Facilities, uh, the seismic work has started. Construction crews are they're, they're very well versed and going through. We have weekly meetings and I usually meet with them twice a week. Uh, they have access to all our structures and permits are coming. Uh, equipment, SCBAs were serviced, a few issues were found. Uh, working on some budget ideas for that for the future, just having some forecasting. Uh, radios as well as the tick batteries. Uh, tick batteries were put on a little different rotation, did some research and drained them down. And, we're working on getting them in a good thing. Apparatus, truck one, it is the aerial that's going in for service. It's always scary when it goes in. Uh, we'll be receiving the bill soon. Engine two, which is currently uh, in the engine one slot, had some issues with the interior lighting, the pump control panel, and their phone pump. Uh, the phone pump's been replaced multiple times. We're talking to the vendor and saying, why has there not been a recall, things like that. But 
Uh, with the cost that incurred with the fleet cost this year, I'm looking at alternatives, possibly, possibly browning out or blacking out some of the units that don't respond if they do respond around the very low percentage rates. Uh, got to look at options for cutting some of those costs that prepare us for the future as so we can go to maybe single unit responses, things like that. Uh, on the EMS side, we have another EMT that just passed his thing. I had hoped to get it on the board agenda, but he didn't get his paperwork into me until right before we headed up here. So uh, that one three, and that makes all of our current resident interns that are staying here at Station mm -hmm. One uh, EMT qualified. Uh, looking to start running them on QRT and helping out with Western Lane stuff. Uh, I did include some data in here from uh, EFO and Standard of Cover, a lot of the things that I'm working on there. Uh, I currently have uh, 204 survey departments that have answered my, my survey, so kind of jumping through that data, there's a ton of stuff to extrapolate. Uh, the time constraints and some of the dependable data prior to 215, it's, uh, it's hard to find baseline numbers to run by, but kind of working through some of the calls and extrapolating that. Uh, I'm not going to go call by call on all of them, but the, the big response is looking at that. Uh, looking at dispatch and making sure we're getting our run times in there. And that is pretty much where we're at on that. Does anyone have any questions for me? No questions? Fantastic. Thank you. Great report. I think that uh, those numbers you have for Swiss and Denver is probably double the numbers that they had a year ago. Uh, there were seven when uh, we first started interacting with them with the with recruitment and retention officer. They're now in the mid-30s. That's great. That's really great. Yeah, good work on that. All right, back to our, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, the new items we last week, last month, excuse me, we had uh, two candidates or recommendations for budget committee uh, citizen appointments. And it was decided that we would uh, engage in a very democratic process uh, of interviewing both candidates at today's meeting. Uh, one of the candidates could not be here. And to be fair, we asked them, both candidates, to provide a written response to some questions that were composed. So I think also recognizing that one, Mr. Tipler is here, uh, we asked there not be any more kind of public commentary or dialogue about the candidacy. Um, by this point, the board has seen the responses, are there any questions or any uh, comments that we'd like to discuss? I appreciate your participation. Sorry, yeah, kind of following through with the questions we asked. It just uh, seemed like a good thing to do so that everybody's on the same page in terms of what we understand about each candidate. Yeah, mm -hmm. we appreciate that happening. Yeah. Um, with that, then, is there a nomination from the board for the Finance Committee of Citizen Appointment? I would nominate Barbara Dibbler. We have a nomination from Mr. Tipper. Is there a second? I'll second. And a second. So we'll put that as a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed? So a three to two. Mr. Tipper is appointed to the committee. That's it. We're all done with that. Okay. And then, Chief, with respect to budget committee meetings, you'll be distributing the yes. information. Yes, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Um, some correspond, oh, excuse me, director comments. Is there anything else you want to bring on the agenda by the board that isn't here to discuss tonight? Now is the time. I will report to the board that last month uh, the board approved a small expenditure to do a salary survey uh, for the positions of chief, operations chief, and operations manager. I received that information back. Good. Uh, there were some questions and honestly some inconsistencies, so I had to restate them, so it's not part of tonight's agenda. I will say that next month I'm going to ask that we address that in an executive session. And I'll send that out independent of the board packet to all, all five of those four of you. Okay, thank you. So, anything else from the rest of the board? I will be absent next month. Okay. Well, I would appreciate uh, you guys want to talk to me independently or any of the members of the board when you get this information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have, I, I leave the 18th. Okay, I'll get it to you long before that. All right, with that, uh, some nice correspondence for reading there. Um, we have our next meeting scheduled for the 18th. So you're leaving what day? 
The 18th. Okay. <laughs> so you get a stop by on your way up down. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll be there early. <laughs> I think the flight leaves at 5. All right. The next meeting Wednesday, April 18th. And with that, this meeting would be adjourned. So thank you. Thank you.